We're going on assignment with the Voice of America. How has it been like covering the event? And I have a list right here in front of me of all the journalists who are beaten. I make the call because I'm on the ground. The Chechen. Gabe Joslo, VOA News, Mogadishu. Welcome once again to On Assignment, taking you behind the scenes with our VOA reporters around the world. I'm Philip Alexio, in for Imran Siddiqui. And I'm Alex Villarreal. We look first this week at Afghanistan, where our correspondent was on the ground for the presidential election many say will determine the country's future. We'll go to Chicago to talk with our Midwest correspondent about the humanitarian work of former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. Seeking asylum, facing punishment at home, gay and transgender Ugandans come to America. And later on, we go behind the curtain of our TV studios here at VOA and meet one of the people who make shows like this work. Well, we are on the air and ready to go. On Assignment starts right now. Voters in Afghanistan crowded into polling stations on April 5th to cast their votes for a new president. Now, former Foreign Minister Abdullah Abdullah is leading the vote count with final results due May 14th and a runoff to be held if no candidate wins an outright majority. Well, the election was relatively peaceful despite Taliban threats to disrupt it with violence, but the run-up to the vote saw weeks of attacks, including on journalists. If successful, the election will mark Afghanistan's first democratic transfer of power. But with foreign combat forces set to leave by the end of this year, what is next for the country? I posed that question to VOA correspondent Sharon Bain, who was in Afghanistan for the vote, and here is what she had to say. Well, that's a pretty big question. And I think that's a question that everybody has in their mind, you know, what happens out. It really depends on how this election plays out. It really does. It really depends on how credible it is that the losing candidate accepts defeat um, to see perhaps they're going to do some political accommodation. Whoever wins, whoever loses, you know, they might give them some political accommodation within the government. And if they sign the bilateral security agreement with the United States, which a lot of people that I spoke to were hoping that they do sign it because that would prolong the American presence. Um, in Afghanistan in a sort of teaching and training mode and also as an emergency backup. I think there are a lot of questions this year and the people are already beginning to say, well, what happens when, you know, the summertime comes? That's always a big Taliban fighting season. I, I think there are a lot of questions outstanding. I don't think anybody could answer that right now. And Sharon, getting back to the security situation, the uh, recent killing of AP Associated Press photographer Anya Niedringhaus, how have these attacks uh, af affected you and what's behind these attacks on journalists? Yeah, the attacks on journalists were actually very uh, jarring, um, mostly because, you know, it's like any attack on any civilian. We're unarmed. We're not there to actually do anything except be neutral and try to report. The first attack was on a British Swedish radio journalist. He was shot in the head in, uh, in the middle of the street in daylight in Kabul. The second one was against uh, a French, uh, a journalist, and actually an Afghan journalist for, who works for Agence France Presse. And his two children and his wife were shot in front of him before he was shot um, and killed. And then there was an attack on, as you said, Anya Niedringhaus, who unfortunately died, and Kathy Gannon, who was working with her, a very well-known AP journalist, and she was uh, pretty badly wounded, from what I understand. It actually did rattle the journalist community. A lot of us know these people. These are people that we know and work with, and um, it, was, it, was, it was a little hard to see that. And then to go out and say, okay, we have to do this anyway, we have to go report. I think all the journalists went out and all the journalists reported, um, local as well as international. Political reconciliation with the militants is seen as the only way to end years of violence. For that to work, neighboring Pakistan, which has ties with the Taliban, has to be on board. Analyst Andrew Wilder with the United States Institute of Peace 
says the leading Afghan candidates acknowledge that. The whole regional thing is going to be critical moving forward. I mean, I think it's long been recognized that this conflict is not just restricted to Afghanistan. It does have strong regional dynamic. But the most immediate worries in Afghanistan are the candidates themselves, says Jandad Spingar, head of the Free and Fair Election Foundation of Afghanistan. You can imagine if one of them, especially these strong candidates, one of them, uh, not accept the result, what will happen? Of course, their supporter will, will come on street and will protest. That kind of upheaval, some believe, could lead to even more conflict in this already violence-ravaged country. So what's the timeline on this? When will we know the outcome? The vote of the vote itself? Right now, what they're doing is a partial count. So they're getting, uh, I believe it's 5% from each province, the 34 provinces. After that comes a preliminary result where, the, where they have more votes come in and they, they say, okay, you know, after the partial, this is a preliminary result. But the final result won't really be known until mid-May. And that's actually quite important because in order for this election to be believed in by the people, they, it has to be proven that there wasn't mass fraud or mass vote rigging as there was in 2009. And again, that was VOA correspondent Sharon Bain. An estimated 7 million people voted in this election in Afghanistan, and a big portion of them were young people. Interesting to note, Phil, that Afghanistan is actually one of the youngest countries in the world, with 68% of Afghans under the age of 25. So it'll be interesting to see how they map out the country's future. Yep, the young uh, coming up to take over. Yeah. They are. Well, time for our uh, short break now, but when we come back, a look at a former U.S. president and his work across the world fighting disease. You're watching On Assignment. When former U.S. President Jimmy Carter started working to eradicate Guinea worm disease back in 1986, there were millions of cases of the disease in Asia and Africa, but now less than 200 cases remain, mostly in South Sudan, and this neglected disease is on the brink of eradication. Joining me now is VOA Midwest correspondent Kane Fairbaugh, who has interviewed Mr. Carter several times. Kane, glad to have you with us today. Uh, Jimmy Carter was the uh, president of the United States, but he's about to leave a, a major legacy in Africa. Tell us about what's going on with the uh, Guinea worm disease. Yeah, this is a marquee program of the Carter Center's health initiatives throughout the world. In 1986, when the Carter Center took this on, as you mentioned, there were three and a half million cases uh, in Asia and Africa. Uh, this is a disease which existed in biblical times. It was known in the Bible as the fiery serpent. Um, many people may recognize the medical symbol, which is a staff with uh, an image that looks like a serpent wrapped around a staff. That's called the catusis. Well, in fact, many people believe that's not a serpent that's wrapped around that staff. That is a guinea worm. And uh, the reason why is to extract the guinea worm from the body, you have to wrap it around a stick. Uh, and so this is a disease which, uh, for those of us here in the United States, we might not have had exposure to. But this afflicted millions of people in Africa. Now it's down to about 148 cases. About 95, 96 percent of those cases are in South Sudan. And the Carter Center knows everybody who has been afflicted by the disease now, and they're hoping that it's eradicated in the next several years. And so once it's gone, it's gone. Is that right? That's right, because it needs a human host in order for it to uh, transmit. So essentially, as long as the parasite uh, is prevented from getting inside the human body, it can't survive, and therefore it dies. Now, another disease that the Carter Center has been able to tackle is river blindness, and they've made great strides in that. What is it, and how far have they come? It's another parasitic infection. This one's transmitted by flies that bite, and these are flies that breed in fast-moving, highly oxygenated water. And uh, to contain or to treat this uh, parasitic infection, it's done through the use of an antibiotic called ivermectin. Um, the Carter Center found out that by administering doses of ivermectin, they would be able to contain uh, the, the inflammation and the infection inside the human body. Uh, 
a couple of years ago, they found out that should you increase the dosage that you give to people uh, annually, you could eliminate it from the human body altogether. So uh, this is the case in which there is a silver bullet. It's the antibiotic ivermectin, and that's what's helping to contain river blindness. I think that uh, much of it has been contained in Central and South America, though there are cases there. Uh, so the Carter Center is using uh, some of its best practices learned in treating people in Central and South America to trying to eliminate it in Africa. Now, I know you have interviewed the president probably more than anybody here at The Voice of America, so you've gotten to know him pretty well. Give us a scope as to what sort of a person he is personally. Well, we've done our 10th uh, television interview during his Call to Action book tour just a couple of weeks ago, and it, it is the great honor of my professional career to be able to sit down and talk to a man who was president, incidentally, when I was born. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about him is that he is so engaged in the topics in which he is passionate about, which he is trying to draw attention to, and which he writes about. And in our interview talking about his new book, A Call to Action, he is gravely concerned about what he considers to be the worst human rights violation in, in the world, and that is the abuse and neglect of women. And I must admit that until I had spoken to him and read his book about this very issue, I didn't know much about uh, some of the problems women face in, in many different parts of the world. And so it, that's his goal. It's to raise awareness. It's to draw attention to issues which uh, might otherwise be considered neglected or unknown. And he does, uh, he does a very good job of drawing attention to those things. And he certainly has. He's been quite successful at it. Terrific. And uh, Kane Fairball, thanks a lot for coming on the program. Thank you very much. We'll take a short break now, but when we come back, fighting anti-gay sentiments and legislation in Uganda, you're watching On Assignment. Homosexuality is a crime in 38 African countries, and new laws in Nigeria and Uganda have increased potential punishments for those charged. To escape persecution, some gay and transgender Africans have come to the United States to seek asylum. For those from Uganda, fleeing their country is a matter of life and death. VOA's Carla Babb talked with me about her coverage of this issue and two transgender Ugandans she met and interviewed here. As she reports, both are very afraid to go back home. So Carla, your story focused on Uganda's persecution of gays and those who have escaped from Uganda to come to the United States. How bad is it in Uganda? It's really, for some people, a life and death situation. If you're convicted of aggregated or repeated homosexuality, you can be sentenced to life in prison, uh, all the way to if you're in a Muslim community like Nikki Mwanda was in, the punishment is death by stoning there. So it's a scary situation, and it's one that a lot of people need to get out of. I can tell you that it's so bad in Uganda. People just don't know what is happening in Uganda. Nikki Mwanda recently fled his African homeland. He is transgender. I'm worried about what is happening to my people. But I'm also scared that when I go back, I don't know what will happen to me. Death threats and police brutality were among the horrors transgender Ugandan Victor Mikasa faced before gaining asylum in the United States less than a year ago. I, I have had people lay their hands, uh, men lay their hands on my genitals, chasing the spirit of homosexuality out of me. When you hear the story of people waging war against a particular group of people, this is no different. And these anti-gay sentiments that we see, not just in Uganda, but across Africa as a continent, what's at the root of this? Is it religion? Why are people having such hatred for homosexuality? Religion is a big part of it. The, there's evangelical Christians on one side that don't think that uh, homosexuality should be legal. There are Muslims on the other side, extreme Muslim groups that think that uh, homosexuality should be illegal. And it's also a big push with nationalism because there's a lot of things going on in Uganda. There are a lot of poor people. There are a lot of corruption um, accusations. and. Some people, including uh, Professor Stephen Taylor, who I spoke with here at American University, say that it's a good way to distract Ugandans from a lot of the problems that are at home. 
And another interesting aspect of those sensitivities is even how you refer to the interview subjects in your story because they are both transgender. So they started out, they were born as women, and then they're now living as men. Well, they were both born in Uganda as women, but neither one of them felt that being a female was really the right classification for them. And so they both chose to become transgender, and they refer to themselves as he, and so I refer to them as he. One person that you featured, Victor, he now does have asylum, but this process is not an easy process at all. Not at all. It's very difficult. He had to wait months and months and months to find out if he could be safe here. Uh, the asylum rate here is about a little better than 50% in the United States. That's the latest statistics. So that's a good sign. But waiting to find out if you're going to be one of those 50-some percent is a very scary ordeal. And while you're fearful for that, you have no way to support yourself because asylum seekers in the United States aren't authorized to work. So he had to rely on friends to have a place to stay, to have food to eat. He said, you're giving us the opportunity to be safe, but please give us the opportunity to provide for ourselves while we're waiting. What struck you most doing this report about the two people you featured, Nikki and Victor, and their stories? Definitely the strength of both of them to be able to tell their story. Because, first of all, the natural instinct to protect yourself is to hide, you know, to, to cover up who you are or to, to stay in the shadows. And both of them were out front and center for years in Uganda before coming to the United States. And Victor still has made it his mission to make sure he gets this out there. And he's willing to step up and talk to people, even when it is about painful memories of his life and painful things in the future, being without his daughter. Uh, and Nikki this is the same way. It, it was really hard because it's really fresh for Nikki. He just came here. He has all of those friends back home. But he still said, I'm strong enough to do this and I want to be an example for others who are in my position. Uganda's new anti-gay legislation is among the harshest in Africa, and it has come at a cost. The World Bank and other donors have withheld more than $118 million worth of aid and loans to Uganda, causing the country's currency to fall. Well, now on to our next segment. On Assignment has been on the air for over two years now, getting the inside stories from VOA reporters around the world. But starting this week, we want to give you something a little bit more. We do, and to get the full scoop, I chatted with the On Assignment producer behind the idea. Check it out. I am here with one of our producer editors extraordinaire, Lisa Vora. Hi. And Lisa is here to tell us about a new segment we're starting for On Assignment, which is very exciting. And the idea for it really, Lisa, kind of started right here at your desk. Yeah, right? you and I were just chit-chatting like we do, yep. and all of a sudden we gave birth to this idea. Well, tell us about this segment. Okay, well, this is a segment where we're going to be highlighting those people at Voice of America who play very important roles, but they're not in the limelight. So we kind of want to showcase these people. Right, so sort of like our unsung heroes, right? Exactly, exactly. And what are we calling this segment? We are calling this... You do what? Basically, in 90 seconds, you're going to get an answer to that question. I like that. Now, <laughs> speaking of the roles that people play here at VOA, you are also about to take on a new role yourself. Tell us what's happening here. I am. We're going to have a new addition to the On Assignment family. She's right here, and she'll be coming in four months. <laughs> and we're all very excited. So without further ado, we can mm -hmm. go ahead and introduce the new segment, You Do What? Hi, my name is Lauren Manassian, and I'm a director producer here at The Voice of America. Five, four, three, two. A little bit about directing. It's basically what will happen is a producer will come in and they'll have a show on paper. And they'll hand that paper to me. And it's up to me to basically translate what the producer wants to the rest of the crew. Della, are your two first guests in the building? Yes. I'm the one who delegates what I need done when. Ready, one OTS? One of the things I learned when I first started television was when everything goes crazy, when the show's completely falling apart, don't worry about fancy camera angles, don't worry about fancy yeah. effects, just get to the camera shot, make sure the sound is there, and keep it going. Okay, let's track take. I'm gonna move everybody, uh, Joe. With members of the The ultimate goal as a director is to make sure the vision that the producer has 
gets on air. Okay, I need the wall reporter in position. When the show's done and you know that you had a good quality broadcast, the camera angles looked great, the audio sounded great, the producer was able to achieve their vision that they wanted to see. It's a really, really fulfilling feeling. And I think that's why I enjoy directing so much because one, I get to create something. Two, the challenges of creating something when things are crazy. And three, the satisfaction of like, you know, basically a job well done. All right, everybody, thank you. Good job. Good hustle out there today. There you have it, a little peek at uh, some of the people who do some of the big work around here, at least one of them. Laron is quite the uh, director around here, really something special. Yeah, he really is, and it's it's really important, you know, not just Laurent, but everyone around yeah. here. It's important to see that those of us that you see standing here in the studio are only a small part of what makes all of this possible. So stay tuned as we feature more of our colleagues in the near future. Well, on to our final story, where we orchestrate our way into the world of rare violins, an instrument I used to play for years, actually. Some violins command astronomical prices while producing some of the sweetest tones. Well, VOA's Adam Phillips tells us about one particular violin that will soothe your ears, but it has a price tag that will make your jaw drop. <laughs> This violin, played by American virtuoso Anakiko Myers, is worth $16 million. It was made in Italy in 1741 by Guarneri del Gesù and represents the pinnacle of violin making's golden age. Myers says it's unlike any instrument she's ever played. The G string is so dark and rich, it really can sound like a cello. The E string sounds as if you're maybe in a cathedral, in a really sky-high cathedral, listening to this music pouring out. Dubbed the Vuitton after a great 19th century violinist who once owned and cherished it, it is only one of the ultra-rare antique instruments that pass through Paolo Alberghini's Manhattan showroom. Usually in this safe, we can have anywhere between five million and $50 million worth of instruments. Alberghini says the Vuitton, which was a nearly perfect violin when it was made, has been nearly perfectly preserved. In a nearby workshop, highly skilled craftspeople repair, restore, and even create these four-stringed wonders. Master restorer Julie Reed Yeboa maintains the Vuitton. She says that even the so-called imperfections in Del Gesù's masterpieces add something wonderful to their sound. As he got older, his, the f hole style became much, uh, much different, longer, more eccentric, as well as his heads became much more eccentric. Many of the world's rarest violins lie silently in museums and private collections. But some, like the Vuitton, continued to provide musical pleasure. And Akiko Myers regularly thrills audiences with it at Carnegie Hall and other venues. Myers has owned two Stradivari violins, which approach the Vuitton in quality. Still, she calls this particular violin her soulmate. She remembers when an anonymous donor offered it to her for her lifetime use. I cried like a baby. As an artist, I think you're dreaming of that kind of moment your whole life. So I just cried. I cried. I couldn't believe it. Adam Phillips, VOA News, New York. So some pretty impressive stuff there. And Phil, if I were to hand you that $16 million violin, would you be able to play it for us? You well, said you played. Well, I would be comfortable holding it, believe it or not. But it's such a difficult instrument to play, and I played it for years, that, you know, I just gave up on the doggone thing. It's just, it's just too tough for me. Yeah, it does seem complicated, but we are very admiring of all the people who do play it. Yeah, especially the ones with the $16 million hey, yeah, I'd like to get my hands on that. I'd learn how to play for that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, listen, that's the end of our show. Uh, we got another one coming your way next week, so stick around for that. Until then, you can find all our shows at VOANews.com, Facebook, and, of course, YouTube. And thank you so much for watching. Join us again next week.